Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today we are going to talk about the ending of the uh, Sin Eater kind of story, although it's not really the ending, as I uh, now know, because I'm reading past a couple issues than what we're going to talk about today. So it's actually not really the ending. Uh, they kind of dip into a new story, like as this Sin's Rising story is ending, they dip into a new story called um, Last Rites. And so today we're going to talk about kind of the last two issues of Sin's Rising and part one of last rites. That way we can continue this, uh, you know, coverage because I actually really like talking about this run. Even though I'm not super thrilled about the Kindred stuff, I got to talk about in this episode who Kindred is because we've been building up to that for the past couple episodes now as we've been talking about Spider-Man things. And I want to get into who Kindred is and some of the questions I have because I may actually be more intrigued than I thought I was going to be about this character. And it may have actually been worth the wait to drag this character out for this long. I still feel like maybe it could have been done a little bit sooner, or at least let the audience know, but that's kind of what Nick Spencer does in these three books that we're going to talk about today. He lets the audience know, and one other character knows who Kindred is, but Peter doesn't know yet. So, uh, so we're going to dive into that. But before we do, I actually have a physical copy of issue uh, 49, which is also known as issue 850. It was a $10 comic. They had a cool Venom cover, so I figured I'd buy it, but also it comes with a digital code, and I haven't given one of those away in a long time. So boom, there you go. If you're out there, go to that website, put that code in, and it'll get a, give you a digital copy of Amazing Spider-Man 49, AKA issue 850. Um, and that's only for one person. So the first person to put that code in gets the comic book. So if, you, uh, you know, if you're tight on money right now, if you haven't been able to check out this series, Go do that. It's pretty cool. There's, um, you know, like the main story in here. And then I think there's like three backup stories. We'll briefly talk about those briefly, but I don't want to get too much into those because those don't really deal with the main story that we've been following here. Uh, but the first book that we got to talk about is called The Amazing Spider-Man, The Sins of Norman Osborn. So you remember back when Sins Rising started, they did a one shot book that kind of gave you the background on Stan Carter and added a, a few things to his continuity and also clarified a few things. And some of you guys told me because I didn't remember his lore completely. Some of you guys corrected me on some stuff. So that was great. We got to learn a lot more about Stan Carter. And we learned also in the backup, like at the end of the book, that uh, Nick Spencer like was talking about how or maybe it was his editor, but someone was talking about how Nick is a huge fan of the Sin Eater storyline and how it was like really important that he handled this character uh, very carefully. And I kind of like what he's doing with him now, but we can't talk about what I've read up to because I'm, I'm like three issues into Last Rites and I'm actually kind of enjoying some of that stuff that they're doing and they do bring Sin Eater back, uh, which is really cool. But in this one, um, this one shot here, it's pretty much just uh, the moments before this issue. That, that's kind of what it is. You know, you kind of get a precursor. So if you haven't been reading the book up until now, this is a good way to jump in and jump in at this point is, is to get this Sins of Norman Osborn one shot. And uh, and it has like, it kind of recaps a little, uh, you know, a little bit about what's going on. It has like a, you know, previously on the Amazing Spider-Man kind of thing in the beginning. And they show, um, you know, these, all the different spider people, uh, you know, like Spider-Gwen and, um, the new Madam Web, you know, Julia Carpenter. It shows all these people and Miles Morales like having nightmares about Peter Parker being killed by Norman Osborn. And they've all been fed these nightmares by something. And, uh, and so all of them have agreed that they're not gonna let Peter kill Norman, or not really kill him, but what, what's happening is the Sin Eater is going around with his shotgun. He's been pulled out of hell by Kindred, uh, so I can't wait to see how they explain that and those kind of powers. Um, and I think I might have an explanation. We'll get there in a second, uh, or in a few minutes, probably. Um, so Sin Eater has been going around cleansing people, right? And uh, every person he shoots, they don't die. They just get a hole blown through them, and then it heals back up, and all of their sins are pulled out of them, and fed into Stan Carter. So he's literally a Sin Eater. He's eating their sins and devouring them and then also gaining their abilities if they have special abilities. So like Overdrive and stuff. Now, you know, Kindred, or not Kindred, but Sin Eater can, uh, can you know, maneuver a car and stuff if he wants to. So that's kind of what's going on. He's like, he's been feeding off people with powers, but he's also been sharing some of that power with followers, uh, people who are kind of coming at, at him almost like in a cult-like way. And, uh, and like a cult, they're willing to do anything he says. So he imbues them with a little bit of the power that he has and makes them a little bit super strong. And so they're going around terrorizing New York City right now, and Spider-Man and his friends have to figure out, you know, you know how to stop it. And in the meantime, uh, you know, what Stan's goal is, the Sin Eater is trying to get to Norman Osborn, and he wants to uh, shoot Norman Osborn and cleanse him of his sins. And everyone's like, Spider-Man, it's a good idea. Let him do it, you know, because if, if you don't let him do it, then Norman Osborn will continue to be a bad guy, and he may kill you one day like we're all seeing in our nightmares. 
And Spider-Man's like, I don't care what you've seen in your nightmares. Sin Eater is working for someone more powerful. He's working for this kindred person. So whatever Sin Eater's doing, it's going to benefit kindred. So if, if, you know, shooting Norman and freeing him of his sins is going to benefit kindred, I can't have that happen. Uh, even if it means we'll get a, a Norman Osborn who's a good human being afterwards, uh, who actually has empathy and regret and stuff, I can't allow that to happen. Uh, we have to stop this and stop Kindred. And so he's looking at kind of a bigger picture. And so is Madam Web in a way, uh, but uh, but she's still kind of playing her mind game things that she does and where she always knows more than everyone else in the room, but she's allowing people to make their choices. That's the whole point of Madam Web is that just because she can see the cosmic answer and what all, all the chess pieces, just because she can see it all and what the master plan is, she ultimately has to let everyone make their own choice. And that's kind of what this issue is, because in the last issue, and by the way, this is by Nick Spencer and uh, Federico uh, Vincent, Vincentini, uh, who is the artist on the book. Um, and uh, I got to say, Vin, uh, uh, Federico's artwork is really good in this story. Um, I actually really like uh, his style. I really like, uh, actually, the colorist and everyone who worked on this looks, it's really good. Like this one shot was awesome. Uh, and every, all, all the characters have, you know, unique styles to them but uh but also like uh there's like a continuity there as far as like like because sometimes you, you get artists like you know, for example for sins rising we've had like you know uh, mark bagley on one issue and different artists on another issue and i think what federico does is like i feel like i'm not missing a beat i'm like oh okay this feels like in line with some of the other stuff and i think federico's drawn some of the other issues too but uh but it just it doesn't feel as jarring like it, you know there's been a couple different artists on this run so far but it doesn't like throw me off completely and venom i gotta give venom uh, that book credit too and, and that probably is a credit to the editors and stuff um as well as that those books when it goes from ryan stegman to a bond coella even though they're different styles the the flow still seems to be there i don't feel jarred you know um and then juan gideon and all the other artists that have been on that book um i don't feel like jarred anytime they pop on so uh so i gotta give the team credit for that like i know sometimes i pick at editors and you know like hey why aren't why aren't you on this why aren't you on top of this or this continuity uh that's also something editors will sometimes work on is is uh you know keeping that visual continuity or at least doing something where it doesn't feel as jarring uh, when they switch artists. They pick artists that kind of feel like and they're in the ballpark of the previous artists. And I kind of like that, uh, you know. So um, big, big uh, shout out to Federico because I really am falling in love with uh, his art style. Um, so in this book, again, everyone's talking about the nightmares they're having, and that's kind of what this is. And it's Stan Carter going to Ravencroft to shoot Norman Osborn, um, and he has all of his followers with him. And then it's Peter at Ravencroft trying to, you know, prevent that from happening. And that's pretty much what's happening through this whole book. And then you start realizing, because you remember a couple uh, episodes ago when we last talked about this, there was a hooded figure that came up and asked Sin Eater to free them of their sin. Well, in this issue, we actually find out who it is, because in present day, uh, or present time, I should say, because it's all happening in like one night, uh, Sin Eater grabs a cop who shoots at him, and he's like, wow, you actually have some guts. Like, you you stood up and shot me. You're not a superhero, you're just a cop, and you shot me. And he goes, but, you know, I'm kind of bulletproof at this point, because I've obtained all these powers. So he grabs the cop, and then, tr you know, turns the cop into a different kind of like a, you know, a, mind control and you start you're like hey wait that looks like mr negatives thing and then it cuts back to that guy who had the hood on and you find out that martin lee uh mr negative actually went up to senator and said look i've done so many bad things and there's a good person in me but there's this negative energy on top of me too i need you to free me of that and so and this is when senator was asking for a sign like you know give me a sign to know that i'm on the right path kindred like send someone to give me a sign and he saw martin lee and he goes Okay, this is this is the sign I needed. So he shoots Martin Lee and frees him of his sins, absorbs his powers, and now he's running around Ravencroft, using them and possessing the cops in a different type of mind possession and getting them to shoot each other and stuff. So yeah, pretty brutal stuff. Stan is on a you know direct path heading right towards Norman Osborn, um, and so that's pretty much what it is. Spider-Man finds out that Norman's been secretly working on something because he's always he always is he's Norman Osborn of course, and he finds a secret lab you know full of goblin equipment. And meanwhile, while they're there doing that, you find out Stan didn't want to go straight to Norman Osborn first. He found out that Ravencroft is storing a very specific um, and special, uh, you know, uh, criminal that they have under lock and key, and that is the Juggernaut. And so Stan wants to purge the Juggernaut first so he can then have the powers of the Juggernaut so he can get to Norman Osborn a lot easier. Um, and then meanwhile, while Spider-Man is, you know, revealed that Norman is still 
playing goblin and still building himself up. He's a, you know, he doesn't have the goblin serum in him, but he is developing more goblin serum, new and improved goblin serum. So it looks like, you know, Norman plans to at one point transform into the goblin again anyway, uh, bringing all those nightmares that all the other characters have, like Spider Gwen, all them showing that they were kind of right, that Norman can't be trusted. He is working on something and we're going to find out more about what he's working on in this issue here, which is issue 850 slash 49. And that is this giant uh, $10 book here uh, that I gave the digital code away at the beginning. And yeah, when I just saw they had a Venom cover, I was like, yeah, okay, I'll just buy the physical copy because uh, that way I can just have it, you know, for my collection. But this book is all just a battle. Like, that's all this is. Uh, and there's a lot of artists on this book. Uh, there's new, numerous, numerous people on this book. And I, I let me see. Like, we have... Um, uh, Ryan Otley, Humberto Ramos, and Mark Bagley are the three pencilers on this story, and Nick Spencer, obviously the writer, and there's a ton of inkers, colorists, a bunch of people working really hard putting this book together, and I gotta say, like, I, I didn't love this issue, to be honest with you, because I thought this was supposed to be the big closure of Sins Rising, but then you find out that Sins Rising just bleeds right into Last Rites, because you actually get more closure and more setup for more story in the next issue that we're going to talk about, which is issue 50 or slash 851 legacy numbering. Uh, that's the next issue we're going to talk about to wrap out the episode. But this one, I don't have a ton to say about, even though it's a giant 10 page book. Um, all we know is that, you know, Sin Eater shot Juggernaut, took his powers. Uh, Norman Osborn takes the Goblin Serum and becomes the Goblin again. And then him and Spider-Man just kind of run around Ravencroft defending themselves and fighting back and they're actually teaming up and the goblin is loving it it's almost like when joker and batman team up sometimes uh where it's happened once or twice like in de uh, death metal and stuff like that uh or just metal i think metal they teamed up at the end to fight batman who laughs but so it kind of reminded me of that a little bit where norman is just like loving the team up and peter hates it like every time norman speaks he's just like he hates it and of course norman is saying horrible things like oh this is great you know who would have think after i killed your girlfriend and done all these things that we would actually still team up and be friends and you know spider-man's like dude we're not friends like we're not teaming up and don't bring up gwen you know that kind of thing so they're getting into it and uh, they're fighting each other as much as they're fighting other people and then meanwhile gwen speaking of her she steps up in the group and says look i don't care what visions you're having madam webb i don't care about any of this stuff that you're saying Peter Parker is the best of us. He is the center of this cosmic web thing. He's the guy who typically always makes the right decision. He's sworn an oath for the past few years that nobody's going to die. And he's even willing to save Norman Osborn, his most hated enemy. He's willing to save him right now. And he saved, you know, Dr. Octopus before and, you know, turned him in a way like, to, you know, to where uh, he had a change of heart towards the end after being Peter Parker for a while with Superior Spider-Man. He's like, this is Peter Parker we're talking about. He's going to make the right choice in the end. So we need to give him that choice. We can't go in and stop him like, like you're telling us we should. He's like, she's like, I'm making a choice right now. I'm not going to go in there and fight him. I'm going to go in there and help him. And because of that, the others, Miles, you know, and uh, Spider-Woman and everyone else, they're like, you know what? She's right. It's Peter Parker. You know, he's the best of us. He's going to make the right decision let's go in there and help him. And so, you know, at that point, Julia Carpenter, aka Madam Webb, she's like, all right, well, that you guys made your choice. That's the, that's what's supposed to happen here. So let's go in and stop Peter Parker from doing any damage and, uh, and let's help him save Norman Osborn. So that's pretty much what the book does. It's them just going in and helping, you know, save Norman Osborn. And let me just derail for a second since I saw it. There were these great uh, tributes to Chadwick Boseman uh, this month or in the, in the past two months in Marvel Comics. Uh, some of them have the banners at the top and then some of them have this big spread in the middle and with a really nice, uh, you know, a written thing here from uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates who writes the, or was writing Black Panther comics around the time the movie came out. So, um, so yeah, so anyway, just R.I.P. Chadwick Boseman. Uh, that dude was awesome. I loved him. Outside of, you know, the Black Panther movies and the Marvel movies, very talented dude and uh and i you know hearing that he was keeping his cancer you know kind of uh low key uh i i admire that because as someone who like i get afraid to tell people about my aneurysm stuff sometimes because i don't think they'll hire me even though they can't discriminate technically but i've been in that situation where it's like my resume uh and i'm not that healthy like, next to someone with less experience than me uh who is healthy and they'll usually get the job and so like you know, sometimes you just, you know, you can do the work and you want to work hard and do it. And so I admire that he, um, you know, he, he fought through to the end and he still did his job and he was awesome, man. Really, really awesome guy. Um, 
and I've heard nothing but nice things about him. So yes, RIP Chadwick Boseman. So sorry, a little side note there. But since they had the tributes in here, I wanted to mention it because they were really nice tributes. Um, so then going back to the Spider-Man stuff, like I said, the rest of the book is just Spider-Man and Norman Osborn teaming up, fighting against Sin Eater, who for some reason, his head is in the shape of Juggernaut. Like he transformed into the Juggernaut size. Like, I don't know why he would do that. He didn't transform. He didn't become, you know, Asian when he took over Martin Lee's powers and he didn't like, and he didn't become, um, you know, black when he took Overdrive's powers, you know? So I don't know why he would grow and his head would go. Cause also Juggernaut's head isn't even shaped like that. His helmet is, but he has an, a normal human head. So like, I don't understand the art choice on that one. Um, I, I don't get it at all. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but either way, you know, th this book is broken up into chapters. So you basically have them trying to outrun Sin Eater, and that's the whole book. And then you have Spider-Gwen having her big moment where she's like, no, you know, we need to stand up and, and help Peter. So they come in and they try to help him. And uh, in the end, uh, actually Norman saves Peter at one point, uh, lifts a giant piece of debris to save him. And he's like, uh, come with me, Peter. He's like, you know, we're going to live together. Like, we're going to both live through this. And he's like, you know, you try to save me and I'm going to try to save you. He's not doing it altruistically. He's doing it because he knows it will screw with Spider-Man's head. The fact that he could have died and Norman Osborn had to save him. So, um, but that's when Norman uh, kind of accidentally, in a, in a little bit accidental way, reveals his big plan. He brings Spider-Man down to the basement of Ravencroft where he's been building something uh, and, and has a plan for the water systems because there's, you know, pipes and everything running through the, the city's waters going through underneath Ravencroft through these old tunnels. And Spider-Man now learns, oh, you were going to do something with the water. You were going to maybe, you know, do something to, you know, get goblin formula out there, whatever your weird plans are that you always have. So he's like, so here's, I see all the tech you have down here. So we're going to now use this tech. We're going to destroy it. And in destroying it, it's going to also help us stop the Sin Eater. And so Norman's like, no, this is something I've been working on for months. And he's like, yeah, but I'm not going to let you do it. So we're going to set your device off now and we're going to use it to stop uh, Sin Eater and not, uh, you know, hurt the population of New York City. So that's kind of what it comes down to in the end. And they do that and they uh, end up creating this liquid tar thing that they sink Sin Eater into. And then, uh, and then at the same time, Spider-Man and Norman are falling into it. But then Gwen comes by and saves Norman. Um, and then all the others come in and save Spider-Man. And they bring him up to, you know, land. And they're like, okay, that's not going to hold the Sin Eater forever. The liquid, uh, whatever it is, like has solidified now. So it's just trapped Sin Eater in there. But he's still the Juggernaut. So he'll break out eventually. Or he has the powers of the Juggernaut. Um, so they're like, we got to get out of here. So is there an escape transport? And Norman's like, yes. Of course, because when I was going to execute this plan, of course, I had an escape plan. And they're like, all right, we're going to get in your ship and get out of here. So they get into this little module and they're heading out to leave. And that's when all of them are standing around bickering and fighting. And that's when Norman finds out that this one's name, Ghost Spider's name, is Gwen. And he's like, hmm. And then he smells her and he goes, ooh, he goes, I know that smell. Really creepy stuff. And they really amp up how creepy Norman Osborn is here. And he's like be being really disgusting, saying really nasty things to Gwen trying to get a rise out of her and of course she's like like Spider-Man's like don't talk to her like that and she's like I can handle myself and so she like punches Norman she's like shut your mouth and he's like oh this is gonna be fun he's like another Gwen to play with and I'm just like oh and they reference like the, you know Nick Spencer because I think he's trying to build up to the one more day stuff we're gonna get into that here in a second um but he's in the like the the Gwen uh children that she had with Norman thing like Every, we all hate that storyline. Like most of us who have read those stories where it was revealed that, uh, you know, Norman Osborn slept with Gwen Stacy. And the reason she went to France all those years ago before uh, when she goes on a break with Peter, uh, she went to have these two children and those children had accelerated aging and they grew up to become, you know, teenagers before Gwen died. And then a couple years later, they were adults and they came back uh, becoming the Grey Goblins or whatever to try to get revenge on Spider-Man. Terrible, terrible storytelling. I hated all that stuff. Uh, the, all the ending of the Skrzynski stuff, I really did not like at all. Um, and so uh, so it looks like Nick Spencer is actually taking a risk a little bit and kind of reminding people that those stories are still kind of canon because I think that's going to feed into what his ultimate goal is with Kindred. At least that's my theory, and we're going to get into that in a second. So again, I thought this was going to be the issue where they reveal Kindred is. It's not. 
but they do have a big moment. Everyone kept saying Peter Parker is going to make the right choice. He's not going to leave Norman Osborn to die. He wouldn't do that. It's Peter Parker. He's the best of us. And then as they're flying away and Norman's saying all these disgusting things to Gwen and he's looking at Peter and he's saying all these terrible things to Peter about like what he's going to do. He's like, thanks for saving me because now I can do this to you guys and that. Now that I know there's a Gwen out there, I can do things to her and it's going to be fun. And Peter's like, I can't take this anymore. And Peter actually doesn't do the, well, the right thing, or maybe it is depending on your opinion on stuff. Uh, maybe he did do the right thing. He throws Norman Osborn out of the ship and into the liquid metal stuff where Sin Eater is basically leaving him there to be taken over or killed by the Sin Eater. And then they're all leaving and everyone's just dumbfounded. They're like, wait a minute, what? Like Peter Parker just threw a bad guy to his possible death? Like he, we're trying to prevent this nightmare where Norman kills us all or kills him. And we came in to be by his side to help him make the tough choice. And he's now taking the path of least resistance and he's gonna let Norman Osborn get shot and, uh, and, and absolved of his sins. Uh, which would eventually make Norman not a bad guy anymore. And they're blown away by this choice that he made. And he's just like, uh, yep. He's like, I know I was supposed to make one choice, but I decided to make a different choice. And he's like, I hate that man. And uh, and that's when, you know, Norman gets up and he starts seeing Sin Eater rising up out of the liquid uh, stuff, finally breaking out. And he realizes his moments are, you know, he's, he's not going to be himself for very much longer. Um, and then that's when we see Kindred at the end of the book in front of a tombstone saying that everything is going exactly according to plan. Um, and then, like I said, there's a couple of backup short stories in the back. Uh, one of them by Chris Piccolo's art. Uh, Kurt Busiek writes it. Pretty good. I just love seeing his art style. I love his panel layouts. I love how he does things. Um, when he did that uh, Spider-Man story from uh, during the Siege story, like that mini series of uh, where Matt Gargan was Spider-Man and he was like running around having fun and hooking up with chicks and stuff. I thought his art style and that was really awesome. And I, I've always loved Chris Piccolo's stuff. Um, he did like a steampunk uh, punk book in the late uh, 90s that was really great too by Cliffhanger Comics. And I've been a big fan of his ever since. He's an awesome dude. So um, so yeah, so there's a short story in the back by him. There's one in the back with a dog named Four Shoes. Uh, Lily four shoes or something like that and uh, she's like a magic dog so Peter teams up with uh, with her in a different dimension to fight like a, a, a magician lady or something uh, or witch lady and then the final story is one that I really didn't like too much um, where it's a uh, you have well this is a character that I think's been around before you have Vulture and he finds out he has a granddaughter so in this book Spider-Man swings by and then Vulture says, oh, that guy ruined my life. I used to be the Vulture. And all I wanted to do was like, you know, take care of my family and take care of you. And, and he goes, and Spider-Man always ruined it. So she instantly goes, finds a Vulture-ish Centurion type costume. Um, and then she goes and fights Spider-Man and beats him in like two pages, just like instantly beats him. And then he says, no, like your, your Vulture is a bad guy. And, you know, and, uh, and I, I only did, I only stopped him because, you know, he was doing bad things and hurting people, including people that were close to me. And then, so she's like, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what to believe anymore. And then she flies away. So I really didn't like that story too much. I, I, all the, every time they try to elevate newer characters by tearing down older ones, I'm like, yeah, can you get the upper hand on Spider-Man? Sure. But he also has a spider sense. And he's also been trained to fight nowadays by Iron Fist <laughs> or, or Shang-Chi, I think was training him. And, uh, yeah, I think it was Shang-Chi in the, uh, in the Marvel books in the, in the Avengers stuff, uh, towards the end of the Bendis run or something. Um, like I, I like that. So to me, Spider-Man's not like he's, he's pretty top tier now. Can he have a bad day? Sure. But I just, I don't like when they're like, Hey, this is a newer character. They're going to get the one up on, on the character you love so much. It's like, and eh, they could have done a different, they could have told that story in a slightly different way and still make that vulture daughter character awesome and cool and threatening, um, without like really you know, do punking Spider-Man, I guess. Um, but it's not a big deal, but I just, you know, whatever. It was just kind of a silly short story in the back that I kind of just rolled my eyes at. And I'm like, yeah, typical modern day writers. They just kind of, you know, they just, they love propping at one side up and, and like, or like propping like one character up while tearing another one down. We talked about that with Rick Remender doing it with Flash Thompson, how he's like, you know, pr he'll prop uh, one character up, but tear down an like Eddie Brock while propping Flash up. So yeah, that happens. And it's, it's not, it's not a favorite of mine. And you'll probably hear some yard work outside. Sorry about that. You know, it's just one of those days. And this is the only time I have to record. So I got to kind of power through it. Uh, so the last issue we're going to talk about is Amazing Spider-Man 50, which is in legacy numbering is 851. And this is 
is part one of Last Remain. So like I said, the end of this book, I was hoping for a big review on Kindred. I'm like, hey, we're spending $10 for the book. We should get something. And they don't do it. They don't reveal who Kindred is. And they save it for this issue, though, which is uh, it came out a week later. And it was like six bucks. Uh, so I was like, wait. So I'm just glad it wasn't 10. I thought it was going to be two $10 books back to back. But luckily, it was only six. But still, six is like a lot, you know, uh, for modern day comics. Um, but I will say I did enjoy this issue more than the $10 one. The $10 one was just a big fight and then a bunch of people trying to prevent uh, a certain outcome of the fight. And they just kind of stretched that out for like, you know, 50, 60 pages. And I was kind of like, eh, you could have condensed that a little bit. Um, I, I didn't really dig that too much. But this, I felt the pacing on this issue was really good. And uh, and it has, um, it kind of picks up where we last left off. You have Kindred in the cemetery. He's digging up a grave and you find out it's the grave of George Stacy, uh, obviously uh, Gwen Stacy's father, who was a police officer. So uh, Kindred is doing something really gross and grotesque. And we're going to start learning what that is in this issue. Because uh, as we know, Kindred, the memories Kindred has uh, implies that uh, that they were a part of Peter Parker's high school group. They knew a lot about that group of people, Flash Thompson, uh, you know, Harry Osborn, uh, Gwen, Liz, Alan, like uh, they knew a lot about those characters. And so, uh, so this is, uh, you know, Kindred revealing more and more that he knows more about Spider-Man's life, even into, you know, Captain Stacy and, and other characters. So, um, so this issue is, is uh, drawn by Patrick Gleason, still written by Nick Spencer, but Patrick Gleason, who I'm a big fan of, loved his uh, Green Lantern Corps stuff over at DC for years and years. And a lot of his other stuff he's done over there. And I'm so glad to see him at Marvel because he kills it. I really like his Spider-Man design. And so the book starts off with Spider-Man not doing so good. He swings through New York. He's beaten up. And then he falls into an alley. And you're like, wait a minute. The last time we saw him, he was with his friends leaving Norman Osborn behind. What happened? Well, this book does cut back. So we cut over to Norman Osborn. We see the moment when he gets thrown out and he's sitting there in the liquid. He looks up and he sees Stan Carter rise up. Now Stan Carter, for some reason, is back down to Stan Carter size. I guess he doesn't need the juggernaut power anymore. But even if he did need it, he wouldn't have transformed like that. It's just so weird. Um, but he's standing over Norman back in his, like, you know, pea coat and uh, in his, uh, his mask. And he's got the shotgun aimed at Norman. And Norman's begging him, like, don't do this, don't do this. But Norman's really just trying to manipulate Stan, saying that, oh, look, we have so much in common. There's a good person in us. There's a good person in you and me. But they're just, they're just uh, you know, the voices, the voices in our heads are too much. And Stan is not falling for it. So Stan straight up shoots Norman Osborn and, uh, and takes him out and purges him of his sins. And then meanwhile, while that's happening, Spider-Man, who's all beaten up, shows up at Doctor Strange's place. And he's like, please, you got to help me, Doc. Uh, something, you know, something bad has happened. And it's probably my fault. And I, I need your help big time. So then we cut back to Stan. He's like, all right, Kindred, I did what you said. Please tell me, you know, like, you know, tell me what to do next. I, I, I finished what you wanted. Free me of this. Take away the sins from me. Absorb them into you, whatever your plan was. And let me go back to being Stan Carter. Let me be a good person. Purge me of my sins. And of course, Kindred's like, yeah, I wasn't going to do that. They're like, he goes, do you know, you remember when your partner died and that sent you on the path of trying to find out who killed your partner? This was the, done in that one shot, Sins Rising, where they kind of went back and illuminated more of his uh, his history, Stan Carter's history. And he's like, yeah, I remember that. And he's like, yeah, well, you were the one who killed your partner. It was you, Stan. You've been a bad person this whole time. And I'm not going to purge you of your sins, like, like, or I'm not going to do what you want me to do. Um, he's like, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take all those sins, though, that you did gather for me. And I'm going to leave you like, essentially for dead. At least it seemed because he gets sucked back into this black hole. And you're like, oh, did he get sent back to hell? We're going to find out in another issue that that's not the case. But in this one, I thought, oh, man, Stan Carter's gone. He gets sucked back into hell. And that's all we're going to see of him. But no, I think we have a redemption story coming for Stan Carter. And I'm very much looking forward to where this is going to go. But this is the last time we see him in this issue. So now that uh, Kindred has this, the souls or spirits and sins of all these other characters, he's able to manifest them and turn them into living carnage looking monsters almost like uh, they're like but they're like cloud they look like they're made of clouds too and dust and stuff so they're like these creepy red monster things uh that are that can go in and possess different people um so kindred is manipulating these things and sending them off to uh you know uh, merge with Peter Parker's friends and turn them against Peter Parker. Uh, and then meanwhile, while that's happening, Peter is, you know, with black eye, he's beaten up, he's back at Dr. Strange's place. And he's like, please, you got to help me. Like what happened was I was on the ship. We were leaving. We left Norman Osborn behind. 
It looks like the Sin Eater must have got to him uh, because then what happened is that all these creatures that were summoned came out of nowhere and they possessed, you know, um, all my friends Silk and Miles Morales and Spider Gwen and uh, Madam Web and all these characters. They have now been possessed by these Sin Demons that Kindred was able to summon and pull out of uh, Stan Carter. So, uh, so now that's what's happening. So it's basically like a symbiote storyline almost where it's like, oh, it just feels like another brainwashing invasion type thing where everyone's under mind, some type of mind control. So these characters characters have like demon things in them now and uh, and they're all turned they all turned on spider-man and beat the living crap out of them and to learn more about that we have to read uh, the uh, the other issues that come out after this and we'll do another episode on them after a couple more come out and we'll just condense them all into one big episode like this uh, but in those ones it's you find out how they get possessed and what happens to them when they're possessed because in this one they just kind of briefly touch on it and you got to read the point lr issues so this is issue 50 and then there's an issue called uh, issue 50 point LR for last rights and they did this back when they did the hunted storyline with Nick Spencer I'm not a big fan of it uh, I don't like that kind of numbering um, especially when they don't count it towards the legacy numbering it's really just uh, you know Marvel just doing things for convenience sake because otherwise we would have already been on issue 850 of Spider-Man if they would have counted the uh, hunted uh, point HU issues which they should have because those were books called Amazing Spider-Man so uh, again just Marvel like they do with Venom they conveniently skip things that they feel like they don't want to just to do a, a, a number legacy issue like a, a milestone when they want to do it as opposed to when they're supposed to do it and when it makes sense to do it so um but i do like this line dr strange says to spider-man he's like oh you know you made a deal with a demon uh how did you think that wasn't going to come back to haunt you and there's a couple ways you can interpret that there could be the one where it's like oh he's just you know this is he accepted his fate when he threw Norman Osborn behind and left him behind, and that's kind of the deal he made. Um, or that could even be a reference to Mephisto, and that's what I'm thinking it might be, because at the end of this book, you see Kindred, he has now the body of George Stacy and Gwen Stacy, their dead bodies, are sitting at a dinner table, and Kindred is putting together uh, like a, a big family reunion kind of thing. And then that's when you're starting to wonder, well, who is Kindred? How does he know all about all these people? And that's when Norman says, because we knew an absolute carnage, Norman Osborn knew who Kindred was in Absolute Carnage. He said, because uh, remember Cletus Cassidy, who was in control of Norman at that time, said, hey, I've been inside Norman's head. He knows who you are. And, and if he ever gets out, you better watch out because he's going to come for you. So now Norman has been purged of his sins. Dr. Ashley Kafka finds him and they're like, you know, she says, you know, Norman, you know, what have you been doing? I see this big lab down here. And he's like, yes, I was going to hurt people. I was going to do all this stuff, but I've been purged of my sins. He's like, I'm sorry. And he's showing real remorse. And he's like, but we, there's something else bigger that's happening here. He's like, another thing that I, I was hiding from people and you have to know what it is. It's who Kindred is. And he's like, uh, Kindred is this being that is going to kill Spider-Man. And, and he has all this power now because he purged me of my sins. So I'm not the threat anymore. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a normal person and I feel empathy. And he's crying. And he's like, I'm sorry. He goes, but you have to help me, Kafka. You have to help me. We have to stop Kindred. And she's like, who is Kindred? He goes, Kindred is my son, uh, you know, Harry Osborne. So, uh, so that's where the book ends is, is you know, Kindred looking in a mirror and seeing the reflection of Harry Osborn. So what's interesting about this is that Harry Osborn has been in comics recently, as recent as that uh, the one shot I read uh, before Venom Island, uh, the one that we just talked about a couple, a couple episodes ago, which was The Good Son. And uh, Harry was in that one, and you saw that he was obsessed with Goblin stuff, but he was acting normal. He had he was with his family, um, you know, he's with his uh, his wife, you know, and he was with uh, Normie, and he was acting normal. So I I'm kind of curious if you remember Brand New Day, which a lot of us don't want to, but remember that before Brand New Day, before Peter made that deal with Mephisto, he got a lot out of the deal Peter did. I mean, he lost a lot too. Like he lost his love with Mary Jane, which they're now trying to rebuild Nick Spencer is. So that's, again, I feel like that's Nick Spencer trying to find a, 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 a organic way to kind of undo uh, One More Day as opposed to doing what One More Day did, which is like, hey, everything that happened from here onward didn't happen. Like that's the lazy way to retcon stuff. And I feel like Nick Spencer's taking his time. And I kind of like that. That's the biggest strength of this book, I feel. Like the Kindred stuff didn't really interest me until now that I know the identity of Kindred. I'm a little bit more interested in that, but everything outside of Kindred has been really solid on this book. So thinking about Kindred, uh, Harry Osborn was dead before Peter made that deal. So when he made that deal, Aunt May, who was dying, she got to live. So that was a plus for Peter. His love and, and marriage with Mary Jane and the possible child they were going to have was taken away. So that's a big, you know, two, three minuses for Peter. 
Um, but another bonus that he got, or another plus, I should say, uh, is that Harry Osborn came back from the dead and was alive again, uh, his best friend. So those were like two positives and two negatives that came out of that. And his secret identity um, was, uh, was returned. So everyone who knew who he was because he outed himself during Civil War, now no one on Earth knew who Peter Parker was. They all, they all had a veil put over them by Doctor Strange. So you have, uh, you know, those three positives and these three negatives have kind of been the, the outcome of Peter making the deal with Mephisto. And, uh, and so now it looks like that's kind of unraveling, but it makes me wonder, is this Harry Osborn, is he the pre-One More Day uh, Harry Osborn? Is there an actual Harry Osborn husk walking around right now thinking it's alive and well and all that stuff? And is this kindred, is this version of Harry, is it one that it was dead? It was pulled from an alternate reality nether realm uh, of hell. And maybe that explains how it has this power to walk into hell and get souls like Stan Carter. Um, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that this Harry Osborn is the dead one, the one that uh, didn't, you know, didn't get brought back, you know, because I think maybe something else came back instead of Harry. Or maybe this dead body did get brought back and was given a Harry shell and, you know, Harry, <laughs> Harry shell, a Harry Osborn shell over it. And then, uh, you know, but it's like an actual demon with Harry, you know, his personality blended in. And then as things have been unraveling in Spider-Man's life and as he's been undoing this stuff, the threads of One More Day, it's caused the threads of Kindred to kind of unravel. And maybe the Harry Osborn side's going away and this demon creature that Mephisto put in its place is rising up. I don't know. I'm, that's just things I'm thinking of. Uh, but I want to hear your thoughts. And by the way, the story's not called Last Rites. It's called Last Remains. Uh, so, yeah, sorry if I butchered that throughout the whole episode. It's called Last Remains. Um, but uh, but that is what we're going to talk about next is Last Remains. They're going to have issue 50 LR, 51, 51 LR, and then a couple other ones. We'll get to those coming up soon. But I want to talk about this one. Long episode, I know. But I wanted to get into Kindred, who they are, you know, that it's Harry Osborn and what that means for Peter. What version of Harry is it? All these questions we'll talk more about in the next episode for sure. But I want to get your thoughts. Let me know down in the comments below as always. And we'll continue our conversation down there. And as the noise continues outside, that's when I'm going to end this episode. So thank you guys for watching so much. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you all in the future. Peace.